from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Chris Murphy. I'm the head of the Near East section here in the African Middle Eastern Division. Uh, the African Middle Eastern Division uh, has three sections. The African section that concentrates on Sub-Saharan Africa. The Hebraic section which concentrates on Hebraica and Judaica worldwide. And the Near East section uh, whose responsibilities cover all of the Arab countries, um, Turkey and Turkic Central Asia, the Caucasus, uh, Iran and Afghanistan, and Muslims in Western China, Russia, and the Balkans. Or you could say our responsibility or the responsibility of the specialists and librarians here stretches from Casablanca in the west to Kashgar in the east, from Kazan in the north to Khartoum in the south. Um, the Near East section's collection is in the local language materials except for our ready reference collection. It aggregates to about 480,000 volumes uh, in the local languages. Uh, approximately one half of that are in Arabic, followed by about 75 to 80,000 volumes in Turkish and in Persian. And then it goes on down through various languages until we get to our smallest collection, which is Ingush, a language spoken in the North Caucasus, of which we have a dozen volumes. And in fact, that is a collection that has shown immense growth in the last year, because a year ago we only had nine volumes. The staff of the collection are the individuals here at the library who are responsible for developing the collection from and about the countries. Um, for which the Near East section has responsibility. And they are also responsible for making the collection accessible to scholars and to researchers um, in the federal bureaucracy, uh, the offices of Congress, and the international scholarly public. Another um, thing that we are tasked with, another activity, is outreach. And outreach is uh, partly what we are doing here. We are making our collections and scholarship based on our collections are having a connection to our collections known to the general public. And not only will you who are here today hear this lecture, but it will be videotaped uh, for later um, mounting on the Library of Congress website, which I think in its last year uh, had about four billion hits. So uh, the people who give presentations here are really presenting to a worldwide audience. And we very much appreciate their efforts. Now, as I mentioned, it's the uh, specialist and uh, reference librarians who are the core to developing and accessing this collection. And they're also, in many ways, the core to getting our presenters. Uh, and to that end, I'm going to ask Mohanad Salhi, one of our Arab world specialists, to come forward and tell us about today's presenter, uh, for whom he has arranged uh, this event. Uh, without further ado, Mohanad. Uh, thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us, and welcome to the Africa Middle East Division. Uh, for over nine years, Viennese-born born journalist Judith Hornock uh, has been dividing her time traveling between the GCC states and the West. Uh, she writes for leading publishers in the Middle East and has lectured worldwide on topics such as business negotiations in the Gulf and the new generations of Arabs at pre uh, prestigious forums such as the European Forum, uh, ALPAC, uh, in two th 2007, uh, and Stanford University in 2010. In her recently published book, Modern Arab Women, The New Generation of the United Arab Emirates, uh, Hornock gives detailed insight into the thinking of the new generation of Arab women. 
Uh, Hornock is also the managing director of media and communications agency Hornock and Partner. Uh, since 2003, they share their expertise with uh, top management companies. The focus of Hornock and Partners is the Arab market. Uh, to the audience, uh, this event is being videotaped for subsequent broadcast on the library's website and other media. The audience is encouraged to offer comments and raise questions during the formal question and answer period. But please be advised that your voice and image may be recorded at, and later broadcast as part of this event. Uh, by participating in the question and answer period, you are consenting to the library's possible reproduction and transmission of your remarks. And now, without further ado, Judith Horner. Thank you, Mohanet Sali, for this kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure speaking today here in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress. This is a very emotional moment for me, standing here in one of the largest, no, the largest <laughs> library of the world, like we heard already before, uh, with the collection of over 33 million books in over 460 languages. Surrounded by all this literature of cultures, traditions, religions, all these different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, like a mosaic. A very inspiring location, and a location that reflects a side of America I always admired and wanted to be a part of. I grew up with this spirit even when I was a little girl living in Austria, Vienna, and uh, when I wasn't busy with something else, uh, I still remember my father when he was talking about America. His eyes used to shine. Um, America was pure joy for him, a promise. It was hope, yes. The eyes of my father always showed hope when he was talking about America. He seemed always to be so confident. America, a land that demonstrated that you can achieve everything in life, no matter which nationality, race, or religion you belong to. America made it clear also for us, the Europeans, that in a country with so many different personalities and nationalities, so many different backgrounds, you have to understand each other to achieve one's goal. Listen and learn from each other to create new ideas, things that would move the world, like the IT industry, Silicon Valley, Hollywood. So there I was sitting as a little girl, listening to the stories of my father. Today, I'm standing here in Washington, D.C., so thank you very much for hosting me today. But let me start by telling you my personal story today, how I reached the Middle East. Ten years ago, I had a totally different picture about the Arab world, and especially their women. My perception was very one-sided and heavily based by the media. My picture was radical, domineering men oppressing women and forcing them to cover themselves. At that time, I was traveling the world, working in the Formula One, and I didn't have the slightest wish to ever visit these Arab countries. Today, I know I made a big mistake then. I judged something I've never seen or experienced myself. I trusted the statements of others. I wasn't critical enough. Years later, fate turned a pointing, at, at, uh, I got it, um, uh, something happened and uh, destiny showed me a different picture. Um, I put my food for the first time on Arab soil in the United Arab Emirates, and I was presented with a very different picture what the one I had anticipated. Local men treated women with respect, and behind the veils of Muslim women, I met fascinating personalities. These women were cut from a very different cloth from the one I had anticipated. I was amazed by their competence, confidence, and goals businesswoman deciding on budgets of millions, managing large international projects, evaluating investments, artists with galleries and international collaborations, female athletes like the first female racing driver. I was surprised. 
I asked myself, and many people have asked me that since, was that just a small privileged minority of the population I had met? I got curious and I took the decision to research the subject further and started talking with women in the United Arab Emirates, Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Every day the names and numbers I gathered increased and I met more and more women who went their separate lives professionally. During that time I decided to write my first book about Arab women. Why, you might ask? Well, I wanted to get the picture right, not only for me, but also for people and friends who didn't know. I was so fascinated about this very different picture of Arab women. It took me about four years to write uh, and research for the book, to take the consent of the woman, to take their photographs. Um, and since it was the United Arab Emirates who was the first Gulf state that showed me the picture, another picture of the Arab world, I decided to write my first book about Arab women, about the women of the United Arab Emirates. So today here it is, a book that minimizes the knowledge gap and supports a better understanding about Arab women. A better understanding about the Arab world, a better understanding about people in the Arab world. The book is written in uh, two languages in one book, English and German, published at the moment in Europe and the United Arab Emirates, and hopefully, I wish one day it will reach the US as well. So today there is a great a dynamism in the Arabian Gulf. It's extremely exciting to see how these people from the new generation have developed in their way of thinking, in their way of life through this time of incredible change. What we have to understand, and it's difficult to comprehend that for today, but in the case of the United Arab Emirates, in just 50 years, five zero years, the United Arab Emirates, for example, has generated a society of the 21st century. And the once the fastest mode of transportation was a camel, today the cars of Formula One racing are a part of the scene with an Arab woman as well. Yes, an Arab woman who set a milestone in the world of motor racing. Nahla Alarostomani is the first female racing driver of the United Arab Emirates. Nahla shocked her society in thinking in a different way. In her book, she tells how hard it was to convince her own people at the beginning that she was on the right track. To be different is sometimes weird and difficult, but for sure, Nahla's actions also caused a lot of reaction in her society. People went to her mom and dad and kept going and asked, why do you let her drive? Is this okay for you? The pressure was extremely high because until today, society and their opinion play a very important role in the Middle East. But the family of Nahla backed her up. They motivated her. They believed in the passion of their daughter, even when it was risky. Forward-thinking fathers and mothers, that's a huge uh, bonus in the Arab countries. In my book, I talk about this new generation of parents too, how they act and react, how they help to develop for the modern Arab woman much easier. Especially when women break the norm, as in the case of Nahla al Rostomani, who is a pioneer, and as a pioneer ventures into a very male-dominated world, the world of motorsport. In the book, Nahla tells, the guys were afraid that I could beat them in a the race. That's the reason why they started to criticize me. The lady should stay home. It's not nice to be amongst guys. Motorsport is a man's world. That's not really a strong argument for a strong-willed woman who is such passionate about motorsport, right? So Nahla didn't give up. She stayed focused. She 
know what to do. What I found very interesting, there is a kind of system these Arab women have to reach their goals. Just like driving smoothly, they keep, just like driving, they keep smiling, uh, sorry again, just like driving, they keep riding smoothly in their behavior without a major accident. And Arab women do it very well. They have it in their blood. In their actions, they are very sense, but at the same time, very diplomatic. They are very patient. They do not pressure. They wait for the right moment. And they stay focused. Quite reformers. Being balanced and diplomatic, this is how Nahla prepared the members of her family with her new ideas over many years. And she prepared them very well. She built up acceptance within her own family. She was an excellent team player. She made clear that she wasn't do, doing anything wrong. She made clear that she was not insulting her culture and tradition. She had a perfect timing as well. Today, Nahla is very popular in her own country, very successful. She's a part of this new generation of Arab women who became an educator in her society, who created a new awareness. Today, a lot of young women want to follow Nahla's steps, so the new generation of the Arab female racing drivers is coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, the speed of change is visible, especially when it comes to the new generations. One cannot generalize, but what I observed over the last nine years is this uh, new generation is very familiar to the Western world. They are international, educated, flexible, communicative, a generation with an immense drive. They have learned that from their fathers and mothers. They followed their visions. They are the generation that is realizing them. The impetus for this dynamism was, for example, given in the United Arab Emirates by Sheikh Said, the late Sheikh Said. Late Sheikh Said, maybe you heard about him, the founder of the United Arab Emirates. He and the late Sheikh Rashid Al Maktoum, Sheikh Rashid Al Maktoum, the father of today's ruler of Dubai, of Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed. So both Sheikh Rashid and Sheikh Said had a very clear vision, pioneering the idea of women's dignity and equality in the UAE society. That was in the 60s. Both believed that women and men have the same values, and they realized that the best investment is to further the education and training of women. Many mothers and fathers have followed these visions. Families from the Gulf area as well. They shaped the way of thinking of their sons and daughters. They empowered them. Today, many of these women, their daughters, are very active business ladies, entrepreneurs working in the government or in the family business. The increase of the female population of the United Arab Emirates, for example, in different economic sectors is incredible. Whether it's in law or politics, businesswoman deciding on budgets of millions, managing large investment projects. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced that financial, as a, I'm convinced that Arab women are a financial powerful group, something that banks and investment funds already know. Talking about investments, one Arab woman comes immediately to my mind, Alicia al Kuwaiti. Alicia Kuwaiti works in IPIC, the International Petroleum Investment Company. IPIC was established by the government of Abu Dhabi. IPIC invests in oil and in oil-related industries globally. So Alicia is a very good example for this new generation of business ladies. She studied outside the United Arab Emirates in Ireland. She speaks fluent English and is gifted when it comes to international investments, extremely smart. She's an impressive woman and personality and very modern in her behavior, especially in business meetings. But Alicia does not shake hands. 
Until today, that's quite common in the Arabian world that shaking hands is a very personal and intimate gesture. And even in the West, it wasn't so long ago that man and woman showed much more conservative behavior. All this had to do with respect, and touching hands was thrown up as well. Today in the Arab world, for example, the United Arab Emirates has already adapted to Western ways of greetings, and many of them practice a vigorous handshake. But with many women, this is still not the case, just like in the case of Alicia, a businesswoman who has close business contacts with Western firms. So how does Alicia indicate that she does not shake hands? Well, at her business meetings, he cr she crosses her hands. Some things that sometimes create a lot of confusion, especially when Western businessmen meet Alessia for the first time. And it happens that sometimes they do not get to a point. And then Alessia has to shake hands again, have, have to, still have to shake hands back. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't that interesting? Uh, especially in the case of such a modern business lady like Alessia. So one must ask, how does this new generation really tick? What I realized is, this, this, despite their positions, despite their success, their culture and tradition still plays a major factor in the lives of this new generation. Another good example for this is the Minister of Foreign Trade of the United Arab Emirates, Her Excellency Sheikha Lubna Khalid Sultan al Qasimi, a lady who is very well known in the international scene. Forbes awarded her as most powerful woman in 2010. Sheikha Lubna is a fascinating personality. She is not only a princess, she's also the first woman to hold a cabinet position in the United Arab Emirates. In the book, she talks that she got a call late at night from Sheikh Abdallah bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the president of the United Arab Emirates, and I want to read that now for you, and he asked her, So she receives a phone call from the President of the Foreign Affairs of the United Arab Emirates. And he said on the phone, the President of the country and the country want you to be the new Minister of Economic Planning of the United Arab Emirates. And then he asked her, what do you have to say? And Sheikh Alumna's answer was, you wouldn't believe. I have to ask my mother. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think this anecdote tells a lot about the importance of culture, the importance of tradition, even in such a case as Her Excellency Sheikha Lubna. Talking about culture, uh, a very personal anecdote comes to my mind. I remember when I had my first business meeting in Abu Dhabi with a local businessman, and after introducing each other, his first question was, how is your father? I was shocked. I asked myself, why does he know my father? Later on, I found out this is the classical way to get a conversation started, mixing private with business, getting closer on different levels to build up trust. There are some golden rules in the Arab world. It's fascinating. They are rooted in the Bedouin way of life, especially their responsibility to invest time in their guests, being hospitable. It's one of the key traits in the Arab culture, and through history, it was an unwritten rule in the desert to offer people food and a place to stay, to make sure they will survive in the tough climate. A very nice tradition to look after each other, take time for each other. I always had the feeling that people from the Arab world celebrating time, celebrating life. 
But, ladies and gentlemen, it is a challenging time for all of us. All of us are on the run, have enormous pressure to deliver, to perform faster, better. This also reflects in today's Arab society. More and more work, more projects, more responsibility. Time is becoming a rare community also in the Arab world. The new generation want to improve their country. They want to prove themselves. As al Kubesi, a member of one of the old business tribes in the United Arab Emirates tells, we are not far from other countries. We have to work very hard to prove ourselves. And with this speed comes a lot of responsibility to prove what to preserve what we have from, from our identity and culture. Asa's story is very interesting. Asa studied uh, in the Guildham University in London, jewelry, silversmithing, and applied crafts. But what we have to understand, that was uh, quite uh, unusual at that time in this part of the world. People expected her to be a designer, that was a well-respected profession, but Aza shocked her society by thinking in a different way. Aza went abroad and studied to create her own pieces with her own hands, being a craftsman, a craftswoman. So it was a little bit like she told them, I'm going abroad, studying in London, being to become a car mechanic very unusual at that time, especially in this part of the world. In the book, Asa tells that when she got back from her studies in London, people laughed about her. And they asked her why she was wasting the money of her father. The society didn't take her seriously. But Asa didn't give up. She kept going. Today, she's as well very well respected in her society. Another part of this um, new generation who became an educator in her society, who created a new awareness, another quiet reformer. Today, Aza is the owner of her own company who creates collection, jewelry, and uh, sculptures in the world of art. And there is another fact I found very interesting about Aza's stories. After studying in London for five years, when Aza got back to her home country, the gap between her and the people from her country was huge. Aza felt culturally lost. Even her English was sometimes better than her Arabic. So what did Aza do? Aza started to research her own culture and tradition. She started to research her past, the past of her family, the past of her own tribes. She wanted to find what she felt comfortable with, her own way. She invested a lot of time to research her own identity. This reflects a typical picture of this new generation, ladies and gentlemen. In my opinion, Many people of this new generation are at the moment searching for their own identity in this speed of time, in this speed of life. Influenced by so many different cultures and traditions, this new generation tries to balance. Because on one side, for sure, they want to keep their culture and tradition, but on the other side, they already adopt a lot of the Western style, lifestyle especially when it comes to business. Many of this new generation um, are already not mixing private and business. They have learned to come to the point quickly. That's very good, especially for Western business uh, people who want to close business co contracts in a short time. But on the other hand, how does that fit with the Arab culture where you have taken hours and hours to get to know each other better, drinking Arab coffee, to build up trust, to get to know the values of others better. So I asked myself, 
how will this new generation cope with this speed of life? Will this new generation lose their culture and tradition? Will everything become more impersonal? How will it go on? Will we be all similar one day, alike, in our thinking, our behavior, all with the same cultures and traditions, with the same values? Ladies and gentlemen, we have to keep our differences, our identity. That makes the taste like a mixed salad. We have to keep our differences, difference and different values. And that's the reason why I'm standing here today in the capital of America, Washington, D.C. I would like to talk to you about my mission because I'm convinced we have to invest more in each other. To get to know each other better, to understand each other's values. I'm not saying we have to adopt them, but we should not fight them or make jokes about them to hurt other feelings, to provoke, like some people of the media like to do. We have to understand each other better, and we have to learn more about other values. And we have to preserve different values. Values are important in life. They keep us alive. They drive us. And only if one knows the values of others, one can develop. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the beginning of a new year a year with chances and possibilities. So I'm asking you today a very personal question. Are you willing to invest in this challenging time with all your own personal challenges that you have to master, with all your responsibilities for yourself and your family? I'm sure you have enough on your plate to deal with. So why should you invest to listen to others, to take time to understand somebody else better, to get to know him or her better? What's the use of it? Well, I did it. I invested nine years, time and money. And believe me, it is and was an immense profit, not only in the business, but also personally. I'm grateful to all the inspirations I received from people in the Arab world. For example, to treat each other in a very respectful way. You can say everything if the tone is right, and you never know. Maybe the person you had disputes with is one day your best friend or your business partner. To learn to forgive. In the book, I talk with the Minister of State about it, Her Excellency, Reem al Hashimi. She is the youngest minister of the United Arab Emirates, and she was only 30 when she took this position. In the book, Her Excellency al Hashimi comments Shakespeare says, To err is human, to forgive is divine. So if you hold back on forgiving, you always have also to recognize you may not be forgiven yourself. So just let go, because you will make mistakes, you personally. So are you willing to invest, to listen to others, to build on each other's values, to create new ideas? Innovator David Kelly comes to my mind. Maybe you heard about him, he's quite famous in the US. He and his company created, for example, the first Apple mouse for Steve Jobs or the first toothpaste. I had the pleasure to present a talk for Kelly's company, a very cool guy. And he says, you have to listen to others. That's how you come up with ideas you would never come up with yourself. It's empathy with people. Try to understand what people really value. It's amazing what Kelly and his company has done. Ladies and gentlemen, you see, I'm from Austria, Vienna. I'm proud of my nationality, my cultures and traditions. And we have a lot I can be proud of. But the people of the Arab world, their values infuse. Let me think 
let me grow. I'm a storyteller and a photographer, and as a storyteller, I remain with the belief, stories from others let us understand. Stories open up our hearts. Through stories, once get to know each other better. Stories make us realize we are not separated, we are part of others. Stories are for sure a fantastic platform for education. We will understand. And what we understand, we want to care, protect. It makes us fearless, living a much more comfortable life. So would you like to accompany when I will go on to tell my stories for my next project? And this time I want to go even further. This time I want to bring for my next projects two worlds together who are one side very different, but on the other side, have a lot of similarities. America and the Arab world. Like the Dalai Lama says, the planet does not need more successful people. The planet desperately needs more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of all kind. So I hope you will follow me and uh, let me leave you with one last thought. Everything between people starts with respect. That is certainly what I have learned over the past years. And I firmly believe that getting to know each other better is the most precious investment of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judith. Uh, do we have any, we have time for some question and answer? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, as I said before, I never wanted to come to the Arab countries. I was really scared. And um, I always uh, was writing in the Formula One about business and people portraits. So I was always interested. I'm a storyteller, so I was always interested about people. And one person told me one day there is a very interesting class, the class one powerboat races. Maybe you heard of them, speed boats. They are like Formula One, similar, but also different for sure. So, uh, and when I heard about it, I said it's interesting, their personalities, and that was when I met first time Emiratis and Qataris, when I go there to this series. So that was the first time I got in touch there because they had also their, um, their teams there. And I was very surprised, you know, how the people treat me as a woman, very respectful, and um, uh, how charming. Uh, was uh, for me a big surprise and then for sure I got curious and I thought I have to know more about this country and these people and then I started to go to the United Arab Emirates and I researched and talked with men and women, not, not, not only women, but as for sure women is a big topic as you know in Europe also in the Western world from the Arab world I thought my book should be about Arab women. So thank you for the question. I get that all the time uh, because they look all very rich and beautiful. I know from the pictures, but there are really a lot of them very beautiful, <laughs> I have to say. And uh, you see, I cannot talk about and for every family about this country, also not for my country. But I can really report you about the trend. And also when you see the numbers, uh, for example, uh, I also had um, uh, only some times ago was in Gulf News in one of the leading newspapers in the Middle East, a report. Um, and they are also again um, reported uh, from the UAE's official news agency, VAM. And they saying, for example, uh, 
Dr. Maithal Shamsi, she's the Minister of uh, State and Chairwoman of the Marriage Fund from the United um, Arab Emirates. And she reported and said that women in the United Arab Emirates now account for 66% of the government workforce with 30% in senior positions and involved in decision making. Um, and uh, for example, can I read that now very clear? Um, so you see here also that there, there are also facts and figures that a lot of women are now in, uh, 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 in top positions. And this is an upward trend that is coming in this country. Yeah? Also in the universities, when you go there, you can see that more and more students. And I was yesterday also asked, and uh, you know, what I also uh, watched is that really the families and the men of the families are very proud how successful and uh, how educated their daughters are. So that's very important. Huh? It comes from the families also. Please, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is a good question, thank you. Um, first of all, I really only know the Gulf countries really well. And this is for sure different, it is also different to the other Arab world. I cannot talk about the whole Arab world. Um, so the United Arab Emirates is very open. Yeah? We discussed yesterday also about it. You have their churches, you can go there. So also from the religion side, this is no problem if you have a other culture, tradition, or religion. Um, Qatar is also very open-minded. Saudi is more strictive, as we know. Um, United Arab Emirates is very special, yeah, I have to say, in their way, how they treat also foreigners. I mean, there are a lot of expats in this country, as we know, the local are quite a few from the percentages. I don't want to quote nor a wrong number, but it's it's much more than 50 or 60 percentage that they are expats there. So for sure there are a lot of different cultures there. Um, United Arab Emirates is very, very open-minded. Uh, Qatar also, uh, all, the, all the Gulf countries I um, visited, exceptionally Saudi Arabia for sure, it's very easy to live there. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, it's the way of thinking and that is so fascinating. I'm very happy for the country, you know, that they have these smarter uh, people there who have to understand it because it's a good investment also a country. And every country will understand it one, one day because you cannot only have men uh, also in the workplace, it will not work. So you need men and women for a healthy country at the end. It's a good investment also. Thank you. Sorry, I cannot hear you. Sorry. Uh, if they are, is this a question? Mm -hmm. You mean change that they change their private life? Yeah, it's a it's a very good question because this I discuss often by my life talks with this woman. It's a like I talk, talked before, it's an immense challenge now for these uh, women and men, but especially women, because for sure they have a lot on their plate. They have, now they are in top positions already. I mean, this is very nice to hear, but you have to handle the whole stuff. So they have top positions. They have families, and they still have family, and family plays really a huge, huge, huge position in this 
country. So if family calls, the people go there, whatever happened. Then they have, uh, or when guests are coming, like I told before, you know, they have to take care about the guests. They cannot say to them, thank you very much, we have no time. They have to care, and they have a lot of family members all over in the Gulf countries. So they have the family, responsibility for the family, then they have top positions, often not only one, two, three. And they have also their culture and religion. I mean, also religion takes time at the end. Five times praying a day is also preparation. So it's a, it's a big challenge. We often, one lady in the book, she's very nice, her Huna Matrushi, she said it's like juggling, you know, all the time. You don't know if you can do it, but sometimes a ball falls down, but at the end, it's okay. Yeah, she, they're trying their best. It's, it's a challenge, yeah, to handle the whole thing. It's a lot, a lot of uh, challenging for the people. I hope they can get it, because culture and tradition is something really nice. I hope they will keep it, no? not losing from the speed of time. No? What do you I need exact a question. What do you mean as wives? Where, uh, You mean if I meet them in the house, if I go there? Now they're having a very normal family life, like they had before. And this is the challenge that they have everything at the same time to handle. They have to go home. They have children. They have, they have children. They have also their business life. As they're living, they are, fam they are also mothers. Still mothers, they're still going, they still marry, you know, they're having, no, this is, but this is the challenge when before they, ha they have been only, but it's also a lot of work uh, to be a housewife. They had been housewives, and now they also manage us. So this is, it's not easy to, to balance that. Yeah. I think, uh, sorry. I, sorry, I didn't get that. So you, I didn't get what you, sorry, again. <laughs> um, yeah. Ah, so you, you, are, you are scared for the man from the Arab country, what happened to them? You are scared for the men of the Arab country if they have to be housewives now or what, in the future. Ah, okay. If you think, this is the question for me, if the men now come more in the position, it will, it will change the society. This is the question for me. Yeah? Is it right? Yeah. If they, uh, no, I don't think that the Arab men now will wash more <laughs> at home. I think they also work, but no, I don't think so. Man, what do you think? You're also from the <laughs> Arab world. He's a better to ask. No, I think from the role and positions, what I, my personal picture is, the role and positions uh, don't change. And they don't want to have it really changed because they, they like this culture and tradition, uh, how they had it before. So I don't think that will change. But the problem is really that they have to balance everything at the same time. And I hope for them that they can do it, you know, and stress. I'm sure it will become a key factor or in the Arab world also. Too much things, we know that also here to do. It's not easy to handle. I don't think it will change, no. Yeah, yeah, please, can. happy to answer. Yeah. 
So I cannot talk about Egypt. You mean from the Gulf countries, so United Arab Emirates. Because Egypt, I don't know. I was not in Egypt. I don't know Egypt. I, I met e Egyptians in, in the Gulf countries, but I wasn't there in the country. If I can report about the Gulf countries or the United Arab Emirates or Qatar. You want to know if, how they practice their, their as being a Muslims, their religion, religions, how they practice, or if they... Yeah. <laughs> Only one question more. The lady was, uh, yeah. Um, one comment, one question, one comment is I met some of those 21st generation women in Tour France. There were quite a number of uh, girls, I'll call them girls, because mm. they were very young from the Gulf states, who were studying at the Institut Tehran, where my sister was mm. studying. And um, while they did not wear a veil or anything else, they said that, number one, they didn't date men. Yeah. And my question is, in your photographs, all of the women are veiled, but they have on makeup. Um, was that like a contradiction? Were they just made up for the photographs? No, 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 no. Uh, thank you very much. No, they look like that. <laughs> but it's not nice sometimes. I, I, I said to them, I don't want to let you in my country because, you know, they're beautiful. Hey, Amen. Not everybody now, but we, they have also this face and they know how to do the makeup. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. And you know, also have to see when they have the veils and the makeup. I mean, I don't look good in that. I tried, so I'm happy I don't have to wear that because they real really fantastic and uh, no, they, they, they have, and they have also this charisma. I often ask myself, is this, is this because I'm not used also to this? You know, everything what's new sometimes for the eyes is something special and we want to have that or so, but they look beautiful, yeah? They have that, yeah. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.